Amen? How many hungry for God's word today? Are y'all hungry for God's word? I hope you are. I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 10. And this morning, the title of my message is The Servant. The Servant. The Servant. We're going to look at verses 35. You know, oftentimes when we look at the life of Jesus, we we know that he is the king. We know that he was the lamb. But one of the things that is just striking about him was the fact that, that he understood very clearly that he was on assignment from God our Father. And he positioned himself as a servant, as a servant, someone that waits on someone else, someone that gives of themselves for someone else, someone ultimately we see that is willing to lay down their lives for the advancement of someone else. God, through servanthood, he frees us from ourselves. He delivers us. He teaches us the value of giving giving yourself for the cause, for God's cause, for the cause of someone else. And he begins to eradicate selfishness out of our hearts. He begins to take it out of our hearts. He begins to free us. When Adam and Eve sinned, they, one of the things that happened was the, the realization of, 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 and I want to just say that their self-awareness, their self-awareness drove them down a path that ultimately started to take them away from God. God, he, in, in reverse, he starts to teach us how to get rid of ourselves and embrace more of him so that we can become truly useful to him. He says, and if any man comes after me, so let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. He delivers us from self. He starts to free us from self because we can be so self-absorbed. But when you come to Christ, he starts to free you from you by teaching you principles. And then sometimes he just breaks you down. But by teaching you principles that you apply to your life that helps you to get rid of you and begin to embrace more of him. Servanthood is such a beautiful thing because it it starts to deal with your ego. It starts to put aside that that sense of, of pride and arrogance that we can sometimes have. And servanthood is something that Jesus walked in and he modeled for us. He is the servant. He is the one who painted the picture of what true service and servanthood looks like for humanity. So Jesus is here and he begins to talk in verse 35. It says here in verse 35, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. (laughs) Selfishness. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you ask. (laughs) So are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, we are able. (laughs) So Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink and and will be baptized. uh, And with the baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to himself and he said to them, now watch this, y'all. You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet... It shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you 
who desi- you who desires to be first shall be what? Slave of all. And he makes this statement. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And I think it's, it's important that, that we see the way that the Lord thinks. It's totally contrary to what the, the picture that the world has uh, painted concerning what greatness is. Greatness isn't, isn't the, the, the bling and the fancy cars and the this and the that. Now, you may have that. But greatness is found in your willingness to lay down your life to serve and to bless someone else. And Jesus is painting this picture that is totally contrary to what they have seen in their communities, what they have seen by the Romans, what they have seen by the Jews and the Judaizers, what they see by the priests and the this and the that. They've seen all this phylactery and all the stuff and all the things that appears oppress, uh, um, impressive from the external and on the surface. But Jesus is getting to a heart issue here. If you want to go up, you first got to go down. And that is the heart of Christ. He came down. He came down. And he's, he came down as the God-man to paint a picture for us of what true servanthood and true greatness looks like. These guys are just wanting to be on his throne. How can I get up there? I want to be up there with you. I want to be up there. I want to be right there, and I want to be right here. We want to be there. And Jesus is helping them to understand, well, if you want to go there, there's some things that you have to understand about, about me. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And it shatters something in our thinking when we start realizing that Jesus is not impressed with us. He's not impressed with our stuff. Remember, he's the king, y'all, and he rides on the clouds. He's not impressed with your ride. <laughs> he, got, he got rides. <laughs> so when we got to get out of this impressive mode and understand that it's not about some image, it's about your heart condition, am I willing to serve? And Jesus is shattering something in their minds because they think, how can I get up there? We want to be on your right hand and your left. The others get upset at them for that because they know. Man, what are y'all doing? You, what y'all trying to do, dog? You trying to go up and keep us down here? No, you're not going up. I'm going up. And, and this is what we do. We, we get so fleshly and carnal, even in the church. We think greatness is, is, is if I've got a title. We think greatness is, you know, you know, I'm over a ministry. We think greatness is, you know, hey, look, look, what, I, look what I got on. We think, we think greatness is all this carnal stuff that we've been watching on YouTube too much. <laughs> we think greatness is, you know, I got a big church. We think greatness is, I, and, and it's all this stuff, and it's just stuff, and it's just stuff. And, and I thank God for stuff. It's not the stuff that's the problem. It's the condition of our hearts. That's the problem. When our quest becomes that, and we don't model after the servant, the master who taught us what a servant truly looks like, that something is going on in our hearts. We have to realize that that's not what God is looking for. He said, if you want to be great, then you become servant of all. If you want to be someone that is looked upon by the angels as someone that is great, then start serving people. Yes. Lay down your life to bless somebody else and give up yourself to prosper somebody else. Yes. If you want to become great, he's helping them to, to shatter this concept in their mind of what true greatness looks like. It's not the stuff. It's not all the stuff. And listen, you're, you're looking at a person that I've had the stuff. And I still got stuff. I praise God for stuff. But in my mind, it always goes back. Like, I, I, you, 70,000 people, 80,000 people screaming my name. One more year. One more year. One more year. That's what there's 70,000 people in a stadium telling me. One more year. 
And I could just remember looking back on all that stuff. And it's so, uh, it, it, it's just so, it's so fake. <laughs> it's so fake. It's so fake. It's not, I mean, it's cool, you know, it's, but it's this, but, but it, if, if I'm out there and I'm fumbling, <laughs> the, the, the same one. That was yelling Hosanna is the same one that's going to yell crucify him. Can I have an amen? You can't do this. <laughs> Can I have an amen, y'all? You, you can't do what you do for the applause of man. And you can't do what you do for the response of man. You have to do what you do because you want the heart of Christ, which is to lay down your life to serve somebody else. And can I have an amen, y'all? And to be a blessing to somebody. God has called us to serve and to have a servant's heart. And he says, and whoever, verse 45, whoever, desi whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. If you desire to be first, then start becoming a slave to somebody else. Start laying down your life for somebody else. This is what he's saying. Because the context makes it clear in verse 40, 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life a ransom, he says, for many. Stop thinking that you've arrived at some special place in Christendom, in spiritualdom, that now you're above serving people. I'm a prophet, man. I don't do that no more. As though you've elevated to another level. I'm a minister now. I don't pick up no trash around the church. I'm a deacon now. I'm a, I, and people get in their mind, if I get to that place, and everybody, and that's not how this business works. You may get that in certain denominations. You may get that in certain places. But you're not going to get that before the throne room of God because there's only one that sits there. There's only one that everyone. Can I have an aid? There's one God. And what happens is we have to realize that God wants us to have a culture and a climate as far as the kingdom is concerned, where we're willing to say, serve one another and nothing is beneath us. It's beneath me to do that. And we have to understand that. And I've said this to you guys for years. That's why here at the church, I don't do, I don't do stuff. I remember growing up in, in the kingdom and I watched guys. And I would watch them. And as much as I laugh, most of you people that have been around here know me. As much as I laugh and I have a good time, I'm always collecting information from what I see. I might be laughing at you, but I'm collecting information. I'm collecting data. Because I want to learn. I want to learn. I'm watching the guys, these guys up here. Everybody else in the church is praising God, shouting, Spirit of God moving. And these guys up here in the big seats, sitting there looking deep. <laughs> as if they're above. Worshiping God and honoring God. And I sat there and I would always sit there. They said, come up here and sit. And I was saying, no. And I said over there, no, you need to come. You a minister. You need to come up here and sit in this pulpit with us. And I'm thinking, well, I'm not, I, I don't know if I want to be up there with y'all. <laughs> I'm just being, I'm just telling y'all. Because in my mind, I'm saying, with Jesus, is so these, Every, you have, why don't you have seats like everybody else? Why do you guys have big throne seats? <laughs> and the rest of the church got, they back hurts. <laughs> can, I, can I just talk to you about it? So I saw this, I was like, I'm not, if, I, I was like, no, nah, no. Nah, I'm not into all that. 
Because this is the thing, y'all. Because, and if people want to do that, when, hey, that's between them and God. I'm just not, I'm not going to be doing it. But I just want y'all to know this. It's hard for you and I to call ourselves servants of all if we're not willing to come down to where the people have need. Can I have an amen? And I want the picture. I want a picture in our church where there's nothing that is beneath us that everyone, if I have to get on the roof and do work up there, me and Minister Adam, to try to keep this church, well, praise the Lord. Let's do it. If I have to come down here and move chairs, praise the Lord. Let's do it. If we got to clean up the bathroom, praise the Lord. Let's do it. If we need to sweep the, 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 the driveway and everything out there, well, then praise the Lord. If at the end of the day, no one is impressed with us trying to be impressive. But what becomes impressive to God is when you take off, oh my goodness, when you take off the clergy collar and you take off all your DDs and doctorates and all these other things and you set them on the side and you get down where people are at and you start getting dirty and you start washing feet and you start moving boxes and you start, can I have an amen? That's the thing that's impressive to God. And people see that and say, that person's a servant. Because that's what the servant, that's what he did. Go to Mark chapter 9. Let's take a look at this. Mark chapter 9, verse 33 to 37. Look what he says. He says in verse 33, Then he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What was it you disputed among yourselves? on the road but they kept silent for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the what the, isn't this something isn't this something how we just get so caught up in who's the greatest isn't it so isn't it amazing how we just get caught up in and how you measure up against somebody else It's amazing how we get so self-absorbed in measuring ourselves and comparing ourselves among ourselves. The Apostle Paul said, the person that does that is not wise. That person that you're sitting next to right now is not your standard. It's not your standard. That person is not the standard. And so what happens is Jesus Christ is the standard. And so we got to constantly be measuring and, and, and making sure that we're looking unto that we're looking unto him because he's the standard. And so we praise God. People are, can give you inspiration. But even those people that are giving you inspiration should be looking at Jesus as the standard. And so it's important to realize, but we get into this thing with each other. We're always looking at who's the greatest. We're measuring ourselves and comparing ourselves and looking at somebody's outfit and looking at their car and looking at their skin hair and looking at their hairdo and looking at their shoes and, and looking at their house and looking at their this and looking and comparing and, and comparing and comparing. Looking at how they sing and looking at how he plays and, he, and not realizing that you need to be competing with yourself. Amen. Can I have an amen, y'all? Not someone else. How am I measuring up to Christ? Because that's, but here they are once again because they have the Adam in us that's in all of us that we need to be freed from on a day to day basis so that we learn the value of just being servants to people. And being a blessing and understanding that's greatness in the kingdom. So they're arguing amongst themselves. And it says in verse 30, 35, and he sat down and called the 12 and said to them, anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. You want to be first, then be last. Be servant. Give yourself. Then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. The, and for us, it's the same thing. We have to get back to a place where, you know how when you were little, you really didn't care about a lot of stuff? 
The simplicity of it. The simplicity of it. Not all this other stuff. And we have to get to a place in our lives where we have a childlike faith and response to God in terms of what he's calling us to be and what he's calling us to do. And we're not measuring it. You don't take our church, I don't take our church and measure it by what another church is doing. Because God didn't call that church to do the same thing that he called us to do. Why in the world did what I measure my, the, our church to somebody else when that church is not the standard? What is it that, are we fulfilling the vision God gave us? There's no need to do that. You can compete and it becomes senseless. And then the devil sits around and laughs. We have to get back to a place of simplicity where it's not about all that stuff. It's about am I just being who God wants me to be and am I doing what God wants me to do? And the optics should not matter because the only one that we're performing for is for God. And hopefully people get the outflow of that. It is important for us to realize Jesus, once again, he's trying to break something off of them. They're trying to figure out who's going to be the greatest. And Jesus is telling them, if you're going to be great, you got to go down, not up. Can I have an amen? amen? Let's go to John chapter 13. Now watch this. John chapter 13. When it comes to servanthood, when it comes to servanthood, we also have to realize that there is a place in our hearts and minds where we have to stop complaining about stuff that we know is just simply a part of your assignment. Okay? Now, let me, let me, let me get practical here. If you're a man in this room and you have, you have gone out, right? You have gone out and you have found yourself a wife. Okay? So you got a wife, number one. Then... You and your wife say, okay, we're going to have some babies. And then you've gone out and you have babies. And then you say, we have one baby. Now we want to have two. Now we have three. Now we have four. Now we have five. So now you got, you got babies, right? And you don't just have one. You got multiples. Now, now watch this, y'all. Now, now you got babies. Now baby need a new pair of shoes. Baby need formula. Baby need diapers. Babies need stuff. Babies and wife can be expensive. <laughs> babies and wife can be expensive. And, and then babies and wife can be expensive. Now, babies and wife who are expensive, now they bring pressure. Okay? They bring pressure. Okay? Now, you're the one that said you want to be married. You're the one that said you want to have babies. You're the one that said you want to have five. Okay? So, so, so then we go before God and we say, God, what's up with this? This is hard. And, and, then, and then, now listen, y'all. And then, and then God said, I know. <laughs> but you said you wanted another one. And, and the point I'm trying to make is this. Stop complaining and crying. Because when we put ourselves in a certain position, there is work. There is service. There is laying down your life that you have committed yourself to doing based on the decisions that you have, have made. You, you, you signed up for something. So to me, when I look, when a brother says, man, I'm working all these hours. <laughs> what you crying for? Keep laying down your life and serve because this is what you signed up for. This is what you signed up for. Pastor, I prayed to God, and he blessed me with this house. Woo, 3,000 square feet. Praise the Lord. This is exactly what I wanted. Okay, good. Two years go by. 
Pastor, I'm trying to clean this thing. It's, it's not clean. There's nobody helping me. And I'm this. Uh, and then what happens is people start, start complaining of, about stuff that now has become your assignment and job to do. I'm not saying that it's easy, but we have to get out of this baby mode. And roll up your sleeves and say, I'm called to be a servant. I'm called to, if I'm called to clean up the house. I'm called to go to my job on time and do what I'm supposed to do to take care of my family. I'm called to do this. This is my assignment. I'm called to lay down my life for my family. Do you get tired? Yes. Do sometimes you need to take a break? Yes. But stop complaining about something that God has assigned to your plate as you've responded to God. And for us, it's important that we realize this because I hear this sometimes and it troubles me. I was like, I'm not going to give you a blue ribbon because you showed up to work on time, bro. <laughs> you got to take care of this family you said you wanted. So stop complaining. Let's get it done. Let's go. And what happens for all of us, we have our moments. But if you find yourself getting into a, a, a pattern a pattern where you're complaining about something that is your assignment based on the decisions that you made. You have to stop and ask yourself, am I being self-absorbed now? Am I getting myself, my eyes off the prize? Am I taking myself away? Jesus, when you watch him go through his life, you see that he was consistent. And he, even when he had a moment where his assignment became hard, he said, nevertheless, Thy will be done. Aren't you grateful that he pressed through his emotion and got it done? Amen. Look what he says here, though, because he's painting the picture. First, verse 1 in chapter 13, St. John. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world unto the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended. The devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, because this is the heart, this is the problem that we have with us as humans, but Jesus is going to break something off of this man. Watch what he says. He says, um, then he called to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what am I doing? What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. We always, don't we always just take it too far? <laughs> Peter, man. I can't wait to meet Peter. We got some Peters in this church. I love it. I love it. it says, Peter said, he says, my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet but is completely clean and you are clean but not all of you for he knew who would betray him therefore he said you're not all clean so when he had washed their feet taken his garment and sat down again he said to them do you know what I have done to you now watch this y'all because he's the servant you call me teacher and Lord and you say well for so I am if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, 
you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you and what? An example. He's the servant, y'all. This is the model. Stop looking at the media to tell you what the model is. Stop looking at the, your favorite musicians to tell you what the model is. Stop looking for politicians to tell you what the model is. Jesus is giving you a picture of the model. He's showing you this is what it looks like. Stop looking at your favorite preacher and stop looking at everything else and start looking at the life of Jesus. And he is the prototype for all of us. And he's saying, I'm giving you an example. I'm the Lord. I'm the teacher. But I'm giving you the example. This is what it should look like in your marriage. This is what it should look like in your home. This is what it should look like if you are owning a business. This is what you're, as a business owner, you should be looking like. If you're serving and you're, if you're working on a job, this is what it looks like. If you're a wife, this is what it looks like. If you're a child, this is what it looks like. He's given us the picture of what it truly looks like to be someone that is in him. And to be someone that has been sent from God. It's about servanthood. It's about laying down your life. And just think of everybody starts to serve one another, what would the planet look like? He's painting the picture because this here, this here is the picture. But now this, this ungodliness is swept into the church where people think that they're above talking to people or that people think that they're above this and that or pastors and preachers. And I'm a preacher. This is what I do. But I see this, I see this where now people become untouchable. Like they're, like they're so anointed that you can't talk to them after service. You can't even say hi. That people are so caught up in this thing that now that, that, that once you took the, when you have the robe on, when you have the robe on, that now I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm Superman. The robe is not a sign of your greatness. Your willingness to lay down your life for Jesus and somebody else, that's a sign of your greatness. And we got this, and I honor. You have to give honor to whom honor is due, and there has to be a healthy respect. I get that. But we've taken this thing to the point that now people are kissing the Pope's ring. And we've gone to a place in Christianity and, and, and just from a spiritual standpoint where we don't realize Jesus is, he says, I'm the example. He says, you do well to call me Lord. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant. Now watch this, y'all. A servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And this is the heart that we should have in, all, in our lives. I'm, I want to lay down my life for my wife and kids and for my church and for Christ. And does it, do you feel good? No. I don't always feel good. I don't feel good. When I get calls, I don't always say, woo, I'm excited to have this conversation. <laughs> Who praise the Lord? I don't do that all the time. But I say, I don't care how I feel because it's not about me. It's about God. It's about God's people. And how can I be a blessing to, 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 to help somebody else in their life? Praise the Lord. Let's go. That's what happens. Phil, you don't always stop living your life based on feeling. Because your feelings will change. They always change. You may feel good one day, feel bad one day. And then now you're on, you have, you start to develop if you're not watchful. If you're just led by your feelings, you develop what I call spiritual schizophrenia. 
you want to be steady. You want to be steady. Jesus is saying, serve. I've given you the example. Can I have an amen, y'all? Go to John. Let's go to John. Uh, Let's go to John chapter 15. And we're going to end with this. Now, I'm painting a picture of of our heart condition. But what I want to do is also help us with this to understand that your heart may be right, but the people that you're ministering to, their hearts may not be. Now, watch this. Their hearts may not be, but it doesn't change. You never allow it to change your heart condition. (laughs) You're going to see this here. They may not have the right heart, but you never change your heart. You may have a person that doesn't appreciate your service. That doesn't. You may be in a home where you you do go out and work hard and you come home or whatever, and then your spouse doesn't appreciate what you do. But it should never change what you do. Because it doesn't, because now watch this, y'all, because it's not about, you're not doing it just for them, you're doing it to God. You may have a person that thanks the Lord and is so excited every time you come home from work or every time you do something or you cook this or you take out the trash or whatever. They get real excited about it. But their, their affirmation should never change what you do either. I just do what I do. I love it. And this time they said, great job. Next time they may not say great job. But the great job the first time is not the fuel that keeps me doing what I'm doing. Can I? Are y'all tracking with me? And, And you have to see that because sometimes the response that you get from your service may not be very pleasant. Look what he says here in verse 18. Jesus says this in verse 18. If the world hates you, you know. St. John chapter 15 verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it, will, it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. He says, remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sakes, because they do not know him, he says, who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not, come, had not done among them the works which... No one else did, they would have no sin, but now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. It says, but when the helper comes, whom I shall send you from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me, he says, from the beginning. Now, this is important. You have to think that the Son of God, he came to the earth to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. many. The Judaizers, this is who he's referencing, they rejected him. They hated him. He's healing the sick. He's casting out devils. He's feeding the poor. He's going around doing good to people and being a blessing to people. And yet... Because of their own unrighteousness, they begin to throw rocks at him and they begin to hate him because he and his servants, in his service, is explo- exploiting and exposing, exposing their unrighteousness. They had the phylacteries. They had the towels. They, they had all the, the prayer shawls. And they had all the things that looked like the image of someone who was spiritual and had a relationship with God, but they did not. Jesus comes on the scene and he exposes them to themselves. They hated the the light. 
They rejected the light because it's exposing their darkness. And as a result of that, we know they had him killed. He dies a death for us. But it's important to see that their rejection of Christ didn't stop Christ from fulfilling his assignment. And you may go on your job and minister to people and serve and do what you're supposed to do on your job. And you may not get an applause from man. Don't let the enemy corrupt your heart to get you to stop being who God has called you to be. Can I have an amen, y'all? He said they're going to hate. And hate is a strong word. He uses this several times. We have to take note. Hate is a strong word. He says they, they're going to hate you. They hated him. They hated me before they hated you. And when you start laying down your life for people, for the cause of Christ, and you're identifying with Christ in his sufferings, there's going to be times in your life where you experience rejection and a backlash and something coming at you. Never respond with the same spirit that's coming at you. Never return evil for evil, but overcome evil with what? Good. <laughs> And then it heaps great coals of fire upon the person's head because they can't get you agitated the way that they want. Ultimately, the devil wants you to get in the flesh. And what happens is we, you and I have to remember this dynamic because built into the Christian life is the word rejection. You may do things for your kids and they are not appreciative. So you rebuke them, do what you need to do, but now you don't put yourself in a position where you start becoming resentful and hateful towards your kids. No, you stay on post and then you allow God to deal with your kids. If you have to discipline, we understand that whole dynamic, but you don't want to become bitter. Jesus never allowed himself to become bitter as the servant. He knew that was his assignment. And we see very clearly here from this passage of scripture, he's telling us, you're not greater than me. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. So stop thinking that you can walk with Christ and never experience rejection in your life. It's built into the relationship. Stop trying to be everybody's bosom buddy all the time. Don't don't lower the standard. This is the thing that irritates me sometimes as a pastor is I sit up and I hear people preaching and I'm saying, you're just lowering the bar so you can get more people into your church and find acceptance. Don't change the standard to meet people's qualifications. You leave the standard to where God has established it and tell people you got to go up. I didn't write it. Can I have an amen, y'all? But we try to change the message so it becomes more easy to digest. But we have no right to do that because we did not inspire this book. We have to leave it there and say, if you want God, you got to go up there. We're not going to change the rules so you feel more comfortable in the service. Well, I'm preaching. I'm preaching right now. I'm preaching. I am preaching right now. Can I have an amen, y'all? We can't. We got to stop lowering it to, to the standard that people feel comfortable. And then we say, you made it. No, you leave it where Jesus said. And built into this, there's going to be some rejection. And so a lot of people don't want the backlash. But sometimes church gets messy. And there's backlash, and people hate you because you told them the truth. They don't like you because you told them the truth. And they don't want to receive it. And so Jesus is sitting here saying, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. But only reason why you will, only way you're going to avoid people hating you is if you just give, an, give them everything that they want. Give them everything they want. I'm just so, I love that church. Why? Because they just tell me everything I want to hear. <laughs> it's so fun going there. I never feel any, any conviction. or I never feel any condemnation, no guilt, nothing. It's just acceptance. It's just acceptance, acceptance, acceptance. 
Do you feel good? Yes, yes. Why? Because everything I wanted, they give it to me. <laughs> you know, and you know what happens? A person like that becomes a monster. Because you're never satisfied. You never can get satisfied. Your flesh, it, it never, it never ceases to crave and desire. That's why you got to kill it. That old nature needs to die so we can get Christ. And, and servant, servant, service is designed to help to free us from us. Can I have an amen, y'all? And Jesus, Jesus is here, and he's saying, even your service, even your service, when you are doing right, sometimes there is a pain associated with it that you're going to have to deal with people who hate you. That don't appreciate you. Don't like you. You you wash the dishes. You stayed up all night washing the dishes. You washing the dishes. You got it all clean. And then the kid comes in. <laughs> oh, I'm no. I'm preaching to myself right now. I'm preaching. I see it. I see it in my house. My wife she washes the dishes, and then the kid come in and oh, boom, boom, throw things and just tear up. And the next thing you know, there's five different dishes there. And then and then they don't even put it in the in the dishwasher. My wife said, Nippy! <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just playing. It's not just Nippy. It's me too. <laughs> and what happens is sometimes you go out, you're working on your job. And you work hard, you do a great job. And your boss comes in. And you're serving. Your boss comes in and doesn't appreciate the work that you've done, doesn't acknowledge it, how do you respond? They don't appreciate me around here. They don't value my contribution. The question is, did God tell you to be on that job? And sometimes to kill your ego, God will have somebody overlook you so that you learn how to, to do things as unto God and not as unto man. Can I have an amen, y'all? Can I have an amen? You may get up here and preach a sermon. I'm going to close with this. You may get up here and preach. And, man, you feel like you just knocked it out the park. People come down and nobody says nothing to you. They don't say anything. Then you And then you... And then when, when you go to collect the offering, when they come to give you the offering, they give you $12. <laughs> so I'm preaching to y'all. What I've learned to do, what I've learned to do is say, God, I thank you. Because this is also helping my ego too. You may get up here and sing. Saying hard, you sweating. <laughs> you sweating up here. <laughs> Woo, we got everybody, 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 you know, you were excited, you did a great job. And people, they may not say nothing to you. What how do you respond? I get I've I've gone I've gotten in car, got in a car, drove. Way up there in Sacramento. Way up there. Preached twice. Hot, no air condition. Church. Preached hard. Pouring my guts out. Praying with people on the altar. Here, great job. Oh my goodness, the Spirit of God moved. Thank you for the prophetic words. That message was just what our church needs. It was a blessing. Oh, my goodness. I'm just so grateful for the anointing on your life, uh, Pastor Napoleon, blah, blah, blah. Okay, here, here you go, here. Ah, uh, yeah. $50? <laughs> I spent more on gas driving up here. I 
spent more on gas driving up here. But I've learned to say, I've learned in my heart to say, thank you, Lord. Because, listen, because at the end of the day, God will also use those moments to see where your ego is at. Let me talk to you to see where your ego is at. Where is his ego at? God will put it on their heart. Give him $50. I want to see what he's going to do. Stop giving the devil so much credit in your life. Sometimes it's God working on that, that ego in you. And make up your mind that no matter what, I'm just going to continue to serve. Because that's what my master did. And I'm not greater than the master. Can I have an amen, y'all? Can I have an amen, y'all? Lord, we thank you this morning that you are raising up a group of people all over the world, a remnant, who have your heart, who have your, your mind, who have your will. They are aligning their will with your will. And you are teaching us that greatness is it how high up we can go, but greatness is how low we're willing to go. You, you divested yourself of all your glory, and you took upon yourself the form of a, a human. And you walked upon the face of this earth, and you laid down your life, dealing with the shame and the rejection, dealing with people lying on you and saying things unjustly against you. Lord Jesus, you went the extra mile as a servant to become the prototype for us. Lord, you laid down your life. Still you are given of yourself for us on a day-to-day -day basis. You sustain us. You have identified with us as your bride. And you're helping us to see that greatness isn't how high you can go up. But it's our willingness to go down and to reach and to touch and to, to serve and to give ourselves, to take care of ourselves and to do whatever it takes, that there's nothing beneath us, that we're, we're I'm too above that. That Lord, help and free us from that mindset and help us to be servants the same way you are the great servant. You humbled yourself and became obedient even to the point of death. Now God our Father has given you the name, Lord, that is above every name. And even in that, you still continue to serve. You still walk with us. And you still talk with us. And you still dispatch your angels. And you still help us. And you still are our advocate. And you still are the person that stands on our behalf fighting for us. And Lord, we thank you. Because we, all, we, we don't always say thank you. And sometimes we are so unappreciative of what you do for us on a day-to-day -day basis. And what we have, you have done, even bringing us this far in our lives. Lord, we ask you to forgive us. For sometimes acting like spoiled brats. Because we didn't get what we wanted. But you have given us everything that we need that we might continue to be servants of the Most High God. And yes, we may have titles. And yes, we may have prominent positions. And yes, we may run this corporation. And yes, we may have all these people serving under us. But help us, even as you do lift us up and put us in high places, help us to have the same heart condition as a servant. Joseph came out of the prison and he was elevated second person in charge in the most powerful nation on the earth at that time but yet he still had the servant's heart because he remembered the pit and he remembered Potiphar's house he remembered the prison and he realized that it was God who elevated me not me myself 
And I pray in this church that no matter how you use us, no matter how far you, you take us, no matter who we're ministering to, people in high places and doing great things, that we would be a church that always stays low. Low in heart. And we never get lifted up with pride and arrogance. And that we always maintain the spirit of humility and a willingness to serve no matter who we are. That we will serve and we'll give our lives for the betterment of your cause, Lord, for the betterment of people that need us. God, we just give you glory for being such an awesome, awesome servant, Lord. Thank you for serving us. Help us to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody said amen. Come on, stand to your feet, y'all. Stand to your feet. share this and then we're going to I'm going to open up the altar for anybody who wants to allow God to kind of deal with your heart I was, we we're getting ready to move into this building, I shared this story before it almost bring me to tears just because God has been so good to us all of us getting ready to move into this building and we needed to move all these chairs these chairs are heavy and there's a lot of them. There's a thousand chairs in here or whatever. I said, I said, I was talking to one of the brothers and I said, we need to move these chairs. We got to move these chairs, man. He said, I'm not moving no chairs. He said, I'm not moving no chairs. Because you need to hire somebody else to do that. I'm not, I'm not supposed to be moving no chairs. And he's big, big, you know, brother. He can perfectly can, can use his help. And I can remember him saying that he would not move any chairs. And that you need to hire somebody else to do that. And I, it always has just bothered me so much. Here we are as people. Knowing where God has, has brought us from, y'all. And God has been so good. But then this brother is so lifted up with his arrogance and pride that he can't lift up his hand to say, I'm going to help my church move some chairs. That the church, far be it from us that we have to hire somebody else to come inside to move chairs when we got all these people here. We can get it done like that. But he's saying, I'm, I'm, that's above me. I mean, that's, too, that's beneath me. I can't, I can't do that. I never forgot that, and it's always stuck with me. And I, my prayer has been, you know, Lord, change his heart. But until you change his heart, make sure that I never have that heart. Just continue to serve. And then you watch how God starts to lift you up. And if God lifts you up, just continue to stir. And if he put, makes you the president of this country, just continue to serve. If he puts a billion dollars in your hand, just continue to serve. If he, can, if he blesses you with all that you can ever think of, just continue to serve. Can I have an amen, y'all? Because that's the heart of the master. That's the heart of the master. So this morning, if you know in your heart, that maybe God is trying to deal with some selfishness in your life. Maybe he's saying, I want you to serve it. And don't stop serving just because you're not getting what you're looking for in, in return. If God is ministering to you about this, I want you to respond to the Lord. And let him take your heart and begin to make it more and more like his. And watch what he will do. Serving, it's not easy. But it's necessary. And there is a reward on the other side. Can I have an amen, y'all? If you know the Lord is ministering to you, I want you to make your way down to the altar so we can pray with you. Everyone else, if you're here, make sure you go and enjoy the fiesta and let's have a good time. But come to the altar and let God minister to you this morning.
because he wants you to be the servant that he's called you to be. Come on down. God bless you.